underutilized region of our world, which is very rare to have something like this that is really underutilized, and bring online a whole new class of vehicle, which is also very exciting as a technologist. We're using really state-of-the-art balloon technologies to explore this whole new realm. So if I can make this go forward, am I using the right button? There we go. So introducing the stratolite. So the stratolite, as the name implies, is a satellite effectively, but instead of being in low Earth orbit, hundreds of miles above the surface of the planet, we are at that interface between the atmosphere and low Earth orbit near space. And we're at 20 miles above the surface of the planet. And one of the aspects of what we are doing is really providing true persistence. So with a balloon, imagine loitering, you're floating. You're floating like an ice cube on the top of the atmosphere. And you can stay over a single area of interest for weeks, months. Our aim is a, is a year. And you can also have access to this environment incredibly easily. That's launch infrastructure. What you're looking at there it is what it takes to launch a stratolite, which is very little. And so you can rapidly deploy it almost anywhere, and we can get the instruments back again. So the kinds of applications that we're looking at are incredibly varied. So for example, if uh, we had had stratolites when Katrina hit, we could have had communications payloads on board. We could have co-located that surveillance payload so that we could not only have provided people with the ability to talk and say where they were, we could have had the first responders find them uh, where they were. Uh, we also uh, communications in remote locations. So if you think of these things, that they can, they can operate anywhere around the planet, but you can uh, launch them and then fly them to where you want. So for example, you could go to an area that has currently little or no communications right now and put one or more satellites to service this area with communications. You could put it over the ocean where almost nothing can get to. Of course, satellites can carry it, go over the ocean. Uh, but unless you have a geobird, it's going to be very difficult to get true persistence for extended periods of time over the ocean. Of course, remote sensing uh, is uh, an area of great interest. And we're getting incoming interest for, for all of these areas. Weather. One of the interesting things about weather is uh, that most of the data that we have, aside from what comes from satellites, comes from weather balloons. Our weather balloons go up, of course, over the land, because humans are launching these weather balloons, where most of our weather starts is over the oceans. And there's almost no in situ data over the oceans, whereas you can put these stratolites right over the oceans and gather the weather right where it's happening. And of course, research. A lot of research to do up there. Uh, and in fact, our CTO, Tabor McCallum, with whom I have worked for a very long time, uh, his father, this is a picture of his father, um, uh, one of the balloons that he was working with in the 70s that was taking large telescopes up to the edge of space and studying our black hole uh, at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So this technology, the basis of this technology, has been around for decades. And in fact, the US Air Force was using uh, this, the, sort of the early versions of, uh, of these ballooning technologies to really study the space environment. Uh, it was really uh, some of the early astronauts, if you will, uh, were exploring this whole new realm of space. Uh, that nobody knew very much about. And they were using these balloons to do so. And in fact, the first people to see the curvature of the Earth were these people here 
1935. And Joe Kittinger, this is really a storied history in this. It's, it's just a spectacular uh, history of, of ballooning. Of course, it actually dates all the way back to the 18th century. Uh, it was some of the very first gas-filled balloons. These are gas-filled, uh, lighter than air. Uh, and so Joe Kittinger, uh, back in the 60s, uh, with the man high, was really pushing the envelope on uh, understanding life support systems for the, for the space environment, and then also learning about descent systems. And then you may have seen a few years ago the Red Sport Ball Stratos jump, uh, where Felix Baumgartner jumped uh, from the stratosphere using a capsule. Uh, he had some terrible issues uh, doing that, almost died, spinning out of control. So uh, we, our team, uh, actually had um, Alan Eustace, Google executive Alan Eustace, uh, came to us a few years ago and said, hey, do you think we could do it without capsule? It seems that the capsule is, is for this particular uh, thing is, is really dangerous. So let's, let's go and explore the stratosphere in this whole new way. And so we took Alan up in a spacesuit, uh, and in three years we went from napkin to flying him three times to the uh, uh, ever uh, higher altitudes and eventually to 136,000 feet from where he space dived. Uh, and this is a balloon. This is one of the balloons that uh, we took. Now, this is a fairly classic balloon as well. This is what we call classic short flight because that's what it is. It's a classic traditional way of using a balloon to go to the stratosphere, not the same kind of system that we use. But this system here, I'm going to show you a video here because you've got to see the video of a... Oh, oh, wait, 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 I forgot. I've got a picture of, of the, the highest flying uh, rollerblades that you'll ever see. You'll never see somebody with rollerblades on the front of their spacesuit. Um, this was actually part of uh, testing uh, but before we took Alan all the way up. We uh, had to do a bunch of uh, jumps out of, out of airplanes uh, to test uh, the way that we got Alan down. Our, our team is incredibly innovative, and they managed to get a system to bring him down super safely without all the spinning, but we had to go throw him out of an airplane. And so the way to get him out of an airplane, because he weighs 450 pounds with the suit on, was by laying him on the front and pushing him out the back. <laughs> uh, so there is the documentary that's coming out about this uh, computer screen near you soon that um, will have all of the excitement in it. But here's a very short version for you. Um, I might add that this is not part of our business model. Um, we, are, we are not planning on routinely having people space dive. Is there any sound? I mean, it doesn't really matter, but it's cool. It's cool music. Um, you might turn it down. So, so bossy, I'm sorry. Just turn, you, perfect. Um, so there he is in his spacesuit underneath a, a, a balloon that once it gets to altitude is the size of a football stadium. You can literally pick up an entire football stadium and spin it around inside. And so there he is going up at a thousand feet per minute. So this is an incredibly gentle ascent. It takes him two hours to get up there. There he was just released. Now he's doing free fall because he, he, one of the records he broke was free fall. So he free fell for almost five minutes. He broke the speed of sound, and then he safely opened his parafoil at about 12,000 feet above the ground, and came in for a very elegant landing. This was his best landing. <laughs> he does have 250 pounds of life support system on his chest, and he's also in a very restricted spacesuit. So so you can't like really do the full thing that you do if you're flaring. Um, and then this is all of the people that, that uh, an army of people that we had uh, making sure that he would be safe when he landed. So um, this is the team that, uh, that did that. And uh, it was an extraordinary project, not only because we were really breaking records, uh, it was, it was just, you know, for, for people who have been in aerospace for, for, for many, many years, you know, doing things as quickly as that, where you go from napkin to flight in three years, was, was spectacular. And it was a really exciting thing to do. And it really demonstrated the team. So this team is, is uh, what is uh, bringing these new stratolites uh, to life. 
uh, now. Uh, and also, all of that technology uh, is some of the underpinnings of what we're doing with the stratolites. The founders of Worldview, um, uh, you see um, astronaut Mark Kelly in the middle. Uh, and on the right-hand side is uh, Dr. Alan Stern. If you recently saw those amazing photographs coming back from Pluto, he's our chief scientist, um, really understands robotics, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and then Tabor McCallum and I uh, are uh, the other two co-founders. Um, I'm the CEO, and Tabor is the CTO. And Tabor and I have been working together for a little while. So some of you might remember, some of you are way too young to remember, but some of you might remember um, 25 years ago this year, eight of us spent two years and 20 minutes in Biosphere 2 Planet Earth being Biosphere 1. And uh, uh, Biosphere, there, there's a marsh and an ocean and a, a, all kinds of exciting things in there. But it uh, was intended to be, um, oh, here's us going in. Um, there's me giving the Queen wave 25 years ago. And Tabor's got his hand over his face. Um, so uh, this was really one of those uh, handful of private space companies uh, that was on Joe's uh, presentation earlier. Um, Space Biosphere Ventures did this. I would say as a business model, it was probably about 100 plus years ahead of its time uh, because it was really about being a prototype space base for Mars. Um, I think we're a little ways from that now. Uh, so the company pivoted and is now doing uh, some really exciting things in uh, on planet Earth, really understanding how our, our Earth works. The University of Arizona runs it, actually. Um, but it was, it was an incredibly exciting project for us to be involved with and was very much an inspiration for what we're doing at Worldview today. Uh, this is uh, Mark Kelly's twin brother, Scott Kelly. You know, one of the things I have heard in my many decades of being in the space world uh, is from astronauts who go to space, and you know, many of them talk about you know, how you know, I really thought I was going to this great unknown, and what I really discovered was planet Earth for the very first time. Uh, and so this is, of course, an extraordinary picture. I'm uh, looking out uh, of the uh, International Space Station, where he was for a year, um, which uh, I'm sure he has a lot of interesting stories about that. Uh, and, and this was the, the early inspiration for the company, for, for Worldview. We initially were a human spaceflight company, and we still are. Uh, we are still developing our tourism uh, aspect of the business. I think it's an incredibly vibrant uh, line of business. I think uh, you know, it's uncorrelated with the stratolite uh, line, uh, business, so, so it's very exciting. This is a capsule that, we're, that we will be developing. Um, and uh, underneath the balloon is the same kind of thing. It's very differentiated from what you'll see out there right now because it's so gentle. Uh, you can be up there for hours, these huge windows, six passengers, two crew. Um, we just hired uh, astronaut Ron Garin this year to be our chief pilot. Uh, awesome guy. So he's not only the chief pilot for this, but he's also developing um, all of the piloting uh, aspects of our stratolites in the sense of bringing down the instrument safely back, back to Earth. Uh, so last year, we did uh, a 10% scale mass simulated version of our, uh, of our capsule system. Um, and I think, oh, and then this is how you bring it down under a, under a parafoil. And so uh, our guys are the uh, only people that have flown parafoils from 100,000 feet. And the reason that's important from a business perspective is that you get long cross range. And so you get pinpoint landing. So you can bring your instruments safely back and land them wherever you need to land them. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really, uh, really enabling capability. So here's a quick video that kind of shows you a classic balloon launch. And uh, uh, this is uh, us with a, a thousand pound uh, payload taking this to the edge of space. Uh, and the imagery here is simply from GoPro cameras. Um, but with not very much imagination, I'm sure you can imagine the kind of fidelity and resolution that we could get uh, on a platform like this uh, with any kind of uh, higher grade system. Uh, so here we are. We happen to fly over a beautiful area, uh, which is up in northern Arizona um, on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And here you're looking down over Lake Powell. Um, this was a test flight for our uh, commercial tourism. 
but it was also a test flight for our Stratolite systems because so much of the technology transfers between the two. Uh, and then, as you see, of course, oh, here we are flying uh, back down now. That's flying at 100,000 feet under a, under a parafoil, coming back down uh, to land. Here we did not land on a runway yet because this is uh, early testing, uh, but the, uh, the, the plan would be to, to land on, on runways. Uh, so this was a test that we did last year. Uh, this is just one of the, the numerous tests we've done. But this kind of gives you a demonstration. This is what we're really focusing on this year. This is the persistence. This is, this is how uh, our team is, is enabling us to really stay over an area uh, to provide persistence. Um, we uh, do make our own balloon systems. Um, and also in this uh, uh, photograph, uh, we're really excited that this year we um, not only uh, did Space Angels uh, get involved in our recent round, which was awesome to have them in this round again. Uh, but also Canaan Partners in Norwest, and in this photograph, uh, if you know Deepak, you'll see him there in the front row. We're also very excited to announce that Tom Ingersoll, who was the CEO of Skybox, uh, is on our board. Uh, so uh, we're, not only do we have an incredible world-class uh, engineering and technical team, uh, we're really excited to have a, a world-class investor team working with us uh, and uh, uh, doing great things. This is a cool photograph. I mean, where are you going to see a picture of, of uh, the limb of the Earth from inside um, a balloon? That's uh, pretty cool. Uh, this, this shows uh, what, one of the things that over the many years that I've been involved in space, you know, sp access to space is something that is just a mantra. We need access, we need access, we need access. Uh, so this is the flights we've done in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and we're not anywhere near, near scaled yet, right? This is, this is over 50 flights um, that we've already done, three of them human flights. Um, our early revenue is in our classic short flight uh, system, so our, uh, we've already got um, uh, flights going with numerous customers, including NASA and, and, and people like that. Um, we have, uh, we're a flight services company predominantly, so at this point in time, we're agnostic to, to what we fly. Uh, so we have a, a number of different uh, exciting partnerships that we're getting ready to announce uh, uh, from all manner of um, both commercial and DOD applications uh, as well. Uh, so, um, we also had a lot of interest from, uh, from states. Um, I was very happy that uh, the state of Arizona stepped up and uh, they are building this uh, facility for us. Uh, it's actually growing out of the ground as I speak right now in um, Pima County and the state. Uh, so this is our uh, own facility co-located with Spaceport Tucson, uh, which is uh, going to be right there. Uh, so we'll be able, and it's also right next door to Raytheon, so uh, uh, strategically placed there as well. So, so there's a, a lot of um, e excitement in Arizona around this, uh, and it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. It's, it's really exciting to go to a launch. Now, I've been to a lot of rocket launches. I went to the last shuttle launch, which was bittersweet. Oh, it was a sad moment. Um, this is very different. This is silent. And it's very gentle. Uh, so, in conclusion, and in summation, I'm very excited that we get to really leverage a greenfield opportunity at the edge of the thin blue line of our planet. And this, I really think, is a new space to watch. Thank you. Uh, I think we're out of time, so I'll take any questions later. I don't see anybody leaping up, so I'm going to run out. Oh, somebody's leaping up. <clears throat> so uh, I just wanted to yes. ask you, uh, how do you keep the the strata launch system from, you know, in, in one place and not drifting around the planet. Yes, exactly. Tell us that, yet. that is the secret source. And an aspect of the secret source is very simple, but oh so hard to do. So it uses the winds. So we use buoyancy control, and, uh, but is 
really wonderful. I love how the planet works. It deliver, delivers things for us to use. And in this instance, it's the winds that go in different directions at different altitudes. And so we get very accurate, very rapid altitude control, uh, change so that we can literally go to different altitudes to stay in one, in one spot. That then also allows us to do waypoint navigation. So we can fly over areas of interest. So you, can, you saw in that one picture I showed a very tight circle. Mm -hmm. You also saw that we kind of started in one place and then we flew to it and then we flew on. So we can do that. So we can fly to an area, loiter over it, and then cruise on to another area. So no thrusters or anything like that are needed? No. At this juncture, we do not think there's thrusters needed. Certainly not for most of the time. There might be short periods of the time in the year where we may need more than one uh, stratolite over an area. Uh, and there, yeah, but at, at this point, no. Not, not necessary. Okay, thanks. Yeah, keep it simple. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm going to go for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, how did you, I don't know if you can answer this. I don't how, know. How, how did you solve the spin problem with you? Oh, I can answer it. That I can answer. How did we solve the spin problem? Yes. So, um, Joe Kittinger, when he jumped, he used a drogue. And a drogue is a fairly common thing now. It's a very tiny parachute right. that doesn't really slow you, but it stabilizes you. And it's a little tiny thing. Think of it like a shuttlecock. And you, you kind of have it on the back here, and it, and it catches just enough air that it stops you from spinning. But the problem that Joe had was rather unfortunate in that it was made of, you know, as you think of a, para a parachute, right? All of the strings come out and join to the parachute. Mm. Well, you're in free fall. So imagine what happens. It wrapped around his neck. So when Felix jumped, they went, well, to hell with that. We're not going to use it because I don't think I want to have that. I, you know, he was a real professional skydiver. So he assumed he was going to be able to stop himself from spinning. And if you were one of the many millions like me who was watching it real time, we were all, as the guy was wildly spinning out of control. Yes. So uh, what our team did was take the idea of the drogue, but very ingenious and very simple, used uh, carbon, a carbon rod, effectively, that shoots out and, and holds it away from him. So that there's no way you get this benefit of this drogue that stops him from spinning without him getting all tangled up in it, which is a very simple solution, but was not an obvious one. And I love simple solutions. They're always the best. A sort of corollary to that is yeah. if, are you, if you're actually opening up that um, shoot on your uh, human capsule at altitude, you know, are there, are there any issues there because of the, you know, how thin the, yes. you know, the atmosphere is? More here. secret sauce. I love it. So um, one, <laughs> one of the great things is that we've been flying now at those altitudes. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the atmosphere is very rarefied. Yes. And so there are things you have to do that, are, mm. that uh, ensure that the, uh, that the wing stays open and that it flies. Now, wings want to fly. They just right. do. So it flies just fine. Mm -hmm. OK. And we've, we've, done, we've done pretty extensive testing now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Josh from Aviation High School Satellite Team. Um, Hi. You, me okay. um, you mentioned you, using uh, stratolites to do stuff normally reserved for conventional satellites. So when, when you. When you have a more established market where people are paying for you to do things with stratolites, if, if the comparison can even be made between objectives for, for conventional low Earth mm. orbit satellites right. and your product, what kind of uh, cost comparison would there be per pound to get stuff to, to the top of the atmosphere? So I'm not talking about cost today. Okay. I'm happy to talk with you out there. Okay. But I think this is live streaming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we we think of ourselves as uh, somewhat disrupting large UAVs 
If you think about large UAVs, um, they can carry a fair amount of payload, but they can't go very far high, and they can't necessarily stay up for very long. Uh, and we are significantly less expensive, a couple of orders of magnitude less expensive than per hour than, um, than a large UAV uh, to fly. Um, so in terms of uh, the, satellite, the satellite world, of course, it completely depends whether it's a large satellite or a small satellite, geo and all the rest of it. But really, some of the areas that I was talking about that are the sweet spots, the things that traditional satellites and the way we currently think about them, which of course is evolving over time, as, as more and more people work in this space, um, is in the areas of true persistence. You know, we can really stay over an area whereas, you know, you're having to simulate persistence with a satellite, unless it's a geoboat, which is, of course, very expensive to get it up there. So true persistence is, is one of the key factors that differentiates us from what we think of as the traditional new space world of satellites. Yeah. Hi, Jane. I'm Alan Boyle with GeekWire. And I wanted to ask, uh, yeah. there was talk about having a flight of a full-scale mock-up of the capsule this year. Uh, maybe you could update us on that and also on construction for a spaceport Tucson. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. you Thanks bet. for asking. Yeah, so, so we are um, really focused on our satellite system this year. Although, I think, as I said earlier, that translates to lots of development in, mm -hmm. in the Voyager system. Uh, we are going to be probably doing that particular flight early next year. It, it has slipped a little bit. Uh, we're going to be getting in the, the mass, the full-scale mass simulator will actually be coming in-house in a, in a month or two, so uh, we'll be starting to work that up. But there's been a lot of work going on in this parafoil area this, this year as well. So, so uh, that, that's um, particularly uh, great for the Voyager system because, frankly, when you think about it, from our point of view, it's sort of the, somewhat the opposite of, of uh, satellite industry. Getting up there is easy because you know, you've got gravity going, working for you because you've got the balloon is just lifting you gently up to the edge of space. And for us, the, the operational, not risk per se, but the thing that we really want to hone in so that everybody has a spectacular time coming back down is this flying part with the... Mm -hmm with the uh, parafoil. So we're really excited that we get to do that many, many, many times uh, with the unmanned systems first before we put people on it, which is awesome. And then in terms of uh, Spaceport Tucson and all of that, uh, the pad's being poured. I mean, it's, it's moving. It's awesome. We can see it growing. That picture that you saw there, we are literally seeing it growing out of the ground. And so we hope to be in it by the end of the year. Come on down. Come see us. I will. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. Hi, this is beautiful and fantastic, and I want to congratulate you on a, on a lovely performance and, a, and just a great idea. I'm Alice Hoffman of the National Space Society, and I want to go, and I think a lot of our members will want to go. <laughs> awesome. Um, is there a free fall component in when hmm. you do the crew capsule, and um, about when do you think you'll be ready to do that? Yeah, we're not publishing a date. We really are not wanting to be constant constantly slipping a day, right? So we're not. Um, I'm, you know, it's a couple of years, probably. That kind of time frame, we're not 10 years out, we're not next year. Um, so there isn't a, a free fall period per se. So uh, the way it works from a flight profile is the capsule goes up underneath the balloon just the way Alan did, uh, and it'll take about an hour and a half to get to the top, and you can imagine that it's pre-dawn, and there's this amazing window that you're looking out, and there's ridiculous stars. Uh, and then when you get up there, the sun starts to rise, start to see the curvature of the Earth and the, the terminus moving across the Earth below you. Oh, and by the way, we have a bar on board, so you'll be able to drink your <laughs> beverage of choice. Perfect. <laughs> and whilst you're on Facebook or whatever your social media of choice is. A tequila sunrise. All right, nice. Um, and then when it's time to come down an hour or so later, uh, the uh, system will detach from the, uh, the power wing will already be uh, pre-deployed. Then you detach from the balloon and you immediately start flying down. So there's, there's a few seconds of, you're strapped in, of course, so you're not really going to go anywhere. So there's a few seconds of sort of feeling a little light, but you're not going to, you know, nothing is clunky. There's very smooth. We've already measured the G-forces all the way through the flight profile, and it's 
fabulous. So we're, we're really wanting to make something that is truly accessible. And how long does it take to get down? Oh, yeah. Good point. About an hour. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we're going to go to lunch.